Okay. So, uh, maintaining the people track, I want to stay in the people track, but I want to kind of transition to the people behind the companies that, that our SR1 gets involved with. And, and prior to that, the companies that, uh, you personally got involved with. And I think of an example, uh, I think we, we talked about, um, uh, the, the fact that I had, uh, Rami Elgandor on my show a few weeks ago. Uh, he was a guest on the business of biotech. He's the CEO at our And, uh, he's a good friend of yours. And I imagine that when you had the opportunity to, to work with him on our Celex, you were like, you, you were leaning into that, uh, gut and intuition thing that you talked about. Yeah. Uh, and I can totally see it. Fantastic man. You're like, I got, I got to get this guy. I got to get this guy. I got to, I got to work with this guy it, to, to great effect, by the way, the company's killing it. Um, how do you, when, when you got the, the, you know, the, the sourcing piece, uh, that, that you mentioned and the selection piece that you mentioned, how do you transfer that sussing out, you know, that assessment of jockeys to the teams that are engaging your potential portfolio companies early on? How do you, how do you transfer like the, the, you know, the Simeon George intuition yeah. to the team? Uh, so you're referring to my team in terms of how we're evaluating companies? To your the, team, right. To, right. And, and this, yeah. is the tra- this is the transition to the people, you know, the jockeys yeah. that are leading the companies that you're bringing on board, right? Like, yeah. um, you know, you, you, you want to bring quality people on, uh, the quality yeah. leaders of the companies you're investing in on. Yeah. And you can, you can, you can, you can source and you can evaluate, uh, yeah. on science and data all day long. Yeah. And then, you know, then, then you get a bad vibe from the, from the guy yeah. or gal who's running the company. And you're like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I want yeah. this one on the team, you know, but, yeah. but you're not necessarily interfacing with every single one of those potentials early on. So yeah. I'm just curious how you transfer, you know, some of that intuition and, and soft skill to, to the folks who yeah. are engaging early. Yeah. And Matt, I want to acknowledge, I mean, again, there's no one size fits all. There might be investors out there that just focus on the fundamentals and the people piece, certainly maybe for later stage public investors, like they don't focus on this. For me, for how SR1 is built, how we operate, it is core, like it is genuinely core to our ethos. And I do think, number one, there is a self-selection process that has happened with the way my team has been constructed. I think people have bought into this philosophy of the power of just the human element of our business to be able to elevate at sometimes levitate uh, the startups that they're involved in, right? So I think that is a, a natural part of the uh, the ethos here. And because we talk about this so much, because we have numerous interactions on a regular basis with entrepreneurs as a team, whether it's new teams that we're evaluating or just inviting our own entrepreneurs in to talk about what they're working on. You know, my my strong belief is that there is enough um, of a pattern around which members of my team are applying what they're seeing through those interactions to what they're seeing, as you say, as they're doing early evaluation. And mm-hmm. again, there's not, it's not like there's one phenotype or sure. profile for an entrepreneur or founder. But I do believe fundamentally that my team, as they're assessing all the different elements of PTS and market size, there is a people element that they are assessing in their own way and they're making an evaluation. And it is an incredibly important part of the overall philosophy of how SR1 invests. And so that, you know, again, there's some trial and error there. We don't always get it right. We sometimes have to you know make changes we have to add capabilities but it is a core core element to the way that we underwrite um, our investments at, at SR1 and so everyone is spending time thinking about this holistically starting from the CEO and then thinking through the organization yeah maybe I'll give you one more point a little bit of a preview for what's to come with SR1 you know so we've added these incredible capabilities to help with summiting around sort of the CFO type leader within SR1 that works with our entrepreneurs to help them raise capital, to help them build out their finance function. Uh, That's Chris Chai, who's been a serial CFO, just an incredible talent and and just such a joy and privilege to have on my team. We have Iqbal Mufti, who is his counterpart on the pharma business development side. So think of him as the CBO within SR1, Mm -hmm. who's really spending most of his time interacting between portfolio companies and the large and mid-sized pharma players building relationships, enabling connectivity way before there's any sort of deal to be had or not. 
The next capability that we will add will be what we call a talent or people capability. It'll be someone that sits as part of the SR1 team to help us when we are assessed, exactly to your question, to help us assess teams, have a uniform way to be able to, to, to evaluate, to think about where are the blind spots, to think about how we can help to augment, bring in talent. So that will be a core internal capability of SR1. And so we are, you know, action speaks louder than words. And so we really are committed to this part of how we build what we call an SR1 edge or spike in the way that we uh, invest in biotech. Yeah, very cool. Uh, and, and and totally acknowledging that there's not a, a pheno, you know, quote unquote, phenotype. Um, are there like must have boxes that need to be checked? Uh, or or common threads that that you look for and say okay well like this is this is going to play heavily into our decision in terms of the the people that are leading these companies. Um, you know the one the one trait is again like the resilience, grit, determination, just mm. self belief that again I don't know if you can teach that, but that that trait I think is sine qua non for what we do as an as a ecosystem. You need to have. That is part of your being, and you've spent time with Rami. You'll know he's he's Superman. Like he comes out and he's ready to take on the world. And that entrepreneur um, needs to have some element of of that capability within themselves uh, to do incredibly impossible or near impossible things. So that's the first piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, beyond that, it really is hard to be prescriptive. Like I've worked with some incredibly talented entrepreneurs that aren't don't have the profile, they haven't been in pharma or in biotech, first time into a role like Sam Kulkarni is a great example at CRISPR. He was a McKinsey consultant before he jumped into CRISPR and, you know, within a few years was the CEO of the company and, you know, is, is in my opinion, one of the best biotech CEOs that's out there, if not, if not the best. Um, and then we have others that have been dyed in the wool entrepreneurs. Gary Glick at Odyssey is a great example who's done done this through multiple iterations and is doing, you know, incredibly well. We have scientifically trained, business trained. So it it really does, there's no one size fits all, but that self-belief, that tenacity, resilience is the key thing. Maybe the second piece I would say though, self-awareness is really important, mm. both in terms of how you build capability around you. So understanding where you're strong, where you need to add depth and capability, self-awareness at the board level, how you engage with your investors, directors in a way that allows for a really, again, um, you know, an environment that is conducive to ultimately uh, executing on on the the plan of the startup, right? That's that's an important element too, I would say. It's interesting. I mean, self-awareness, we could talk all day about this philosophically, but it, it intrigues me. Self-awareness, uh, you know, in, in my mind requires a, a healthy dose of, of humility. And when you talk, you talk about Superman, like, you know, you talk about Rami, like, yeah, I get that impression too. And I've spent enough time with him to, and I've, I, I, I credit myself with a little bit of decent gut and intuition. Like I believe that guy to be genuine. I believe him yeah. to be the real deal after spending time with him. Uh, but I've seen a lot of, you know, self described supermen who maybe weren't, you know, maybe didn't have the, the humility to apply some self-awareness and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe weren't those super people. So, um, that, I mean, it, I guess it just reinforces the point you've made about, about gut and intuition, right? Like, like, how do you vet? How do you, how do you, aside from, you know, credentials and, and training, yeah. how do you vet, um, how do you vet genuine? Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, it's not easy. And again, I think the ways to potentially mitigate against making a wrong determination there is seeing someone over time. So a longitudinal experience can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. So in the case of Rami, I've known him since he was at Wharton or finishing Wharton all the way through to when he you know, joined as the Arcelic CEO. So I'd seen him over many roles and years and careers. So I know, I know who Rami is. I know his authenticity, how genuine he is. You know, you, I won't always have that opportunity with uh, yeah. you know everyone that I'm working with, but in general, I I will try and spend time with entrepreneurs and founders over an extended period. Right, get to know them before, frankly, their company is raising capital. Get to know the company before they're actually raising capital, so it's not 
so much of a forced interaction around a specific ask or point in time. Um, so I think about, I think that's one way. I do think you have to be comfortable with your intuition and gut. And then again, referencing can be, if done appropriately, can be done in a way that can really peel the, the onion to layers and depth that can really give you a better sense of the person. I think that's helpful. Um, but uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, listen, there's some of these key strengths can turn into your weaknesses too also, right? So you have to be, you know, you have to sort of be mindful of that. And I do want to hone in on one point you, you, you know, I mentioned first, then you brought up like this idea of like Superman, like I genuinely do believe we need more like high, high, you know, high in high positions, women that can represent the broader ecosystem and demographics of our business. And if we do that, our companies will be in a better shape, in my opinion, right? To have the diversity of experiences, life experiences, work experiences, just thoughts that a broader set of um, of the demographic can represent. And that's one of the things at SR1 we've certainly been leaning into. Uh, and I want to acknowledge Jill from my team in particular, who really has been focused on this in terms of getting more women involved at the board level in management roles. And I think it's that is a massive opportunity for our entire um, industry, but for SR1, something that we are going to use to our advantage, right? To, to be able to really differentiate. And I think doing this, frankly, adds to just the, the richness of these management teams, because I think there's talent that's available that, you know, frankly, has, has been maybe not looked at in the same light that it deserves to be. 